On October 8, 1871, fires swept across portions of Wisconsin with devastating effect. Often referred to as the Peshtigo Fire, large areas on both sides of Green Bay were destroyed. Most people know of the Chicago Fire that occurred on the same day. Few people realize that the fires in Wisconsin took five times as many lives, left thousands more with nothing, and burned 1.3 million acres. The Great Fire of 1871 in Northeast Wisconsin is still the single deadliest fire in U.S. history. Belgians started immigrating to Northeast Wisconsin in 1853, and by 1871, they established several small but growing communities on the east side of the bay in Brown, Door, and Kiwanee counties that laid in the path of the fire. This is their story. Belgian immigrants came to Wisconsin because they had dreams of owning larger farms. That wasn't possible for them in Belgium. It was crowded in their homeland. Farms were small, land ownership was limited, and there was little economic opportunity. In Wisconsin, which had only recently become a state, they could buy land in large parcels for $1.25 an acre, and sometimes even less. Most of the Belgians started coming in 1853, just a small number. In 1854, about 300 came. In 1855, 1,500 Belgians came. By 1856, 2,500 Belgians immigrated. In 1856 alone. In 1857, it was down to about 300 people. I'm just talking about the Belgians that came to, to northeastern Wisconsin. The majority of them came from Green Bay on foot, from what I understand, or drop points off the bay. Generally, the husband and some adult sons went first, and they kind of got a little homestead clearing, went back to Green Bay, picked up their wives and children, and then they started the long journey of walking into their property. They had to carry their food, they had to carry their clothes, they had to carry their, their birth certificates, they had to carry their shovels, their axes, their saws. It was quite a journey to get from the city of Green Bay into uh, town of uh, Red River, to, to Lincoln, to Brussels, to Union, to Gardner, to Humboldt, wherever, town of Scott, wherever they were settling. It was the same process, blazed their way through to get to, the, to their land site. Then became the, the slow process of, uh, of seeding crops, you know, potatoes, that was the main crop, I guess, and some wheat, and cutting down the, the trees and dragging the trees to be burnt very physical labor as you probably heard they had to drag their their disc and drag their, their drags and plows whatever they needed to, to get started between the stumps and the land so so after a period of uh two years and three years by 1860 if you check the 1860 agricultural census you'll find a good idea of what's going on and uh looking over the agricultural census you'll find that almost every family at this point had a a milking cow, two oxen, and two to three hogs. The Belgians' first priority was to clear the land so they could farm. They used the wood from the massive trees to build log cabins and other needed things. The furniture in their homes was made of logs cut in half. Tree trunks served as tables and cedar balsam boughs were beds. Even roads were made of wood called corduroy roads and they were made of logs laid side by side across the roadway. The early economy in the Belgian settlements developed around logging and shingle making, sawmills sprang up to produce lumber for local building, and products were shipped through the local docks to Green Bay and beyond. In 1868, four million handmade shingles were shipped from the Brussels area alone. It was really hard work, but it allowed the Belgians to build better homes and start farms and build communities, including churches, schools, and more businesses. Common practices of the day would play a significant role in the Great Fire. As trees were cut, limbs, bark, and other waste were left in the forest. Sawdust from cutting the trees and from the mills accumulated. Some of it was used for things like dust control or to make mattresses, but much of it was waste. It was common practice for farmers to clear the land with fire. 
Fire was also used for day-to-day -day tasks such as campfires, cooking, or to dispose of garbage. So as a result, seeing fires burning in various areas was pretty common in those days. And consequently, Belgians were used to extinguishing fires with buckets of water from wells or a nearby creek. Buildings of all type were often lost. But 1871 was different. We built a log home. We built a farm and a barn that had an oxen. Oh, things were looking really good. We had our first son, Eugene, was born. Oh, we finally could relax a little. But it was not to be so. You see, the year was 1871. It was a dry, dry year. There hadn't been any snow in the winter time. There hadn't been any rain of any amount prior. It was so dry that you could walk through the swamps and your feet wouldn't get wet. There had been fires burning all over for months. There was a fire here, a fire there. Cedar logs were going up over there. Fences were going. All of a sudden, a shingle mill would go up in smoke. You see, everything, everything, everything was governed by trees and wood. The roads were corduroy roads, which were logs side by side. So if they burned, there was no escape. You couldn't get anywhere. The sawdust was in piles and sawdust was used to keep the dust down. Farmers were lighting fires to get rid of the slashings, which were the tree branches. So they would light fires to clear their land and not really pay real close attention to them. So that added to the problem. The hot, dry conditions disrupted preparations for the coming winter. Fall activities, such as smoking and drying meat, making soap, scalding chicken, and rendering lard, increased the risk of a fire. Children were sometimes stationed nearby to make sure sparks were immediately put out. Attending school became secondary to protecting the home. The grandfather uh, said him and his family, his dad and mother, they were quite old. They started with sickles and started carving the long dry grass that was around their buildings. The barn, the pig pen, all the, their little buildings, the chicken coop. Well, it gets to be that you're careless and the, the grass grows around it. And that was a good thing for fire. The fire at least likes the, the dry grass. And they got to work and the neighbors were together and they all worked hard to get that old grass taken away from the buildings. And... In late September, there were fires at the mills in the New Franken town of Humboldt area. Lamb, Watson, and company, a logging and sawmill operation in the area of New Franken, would report that two logging camps had burned, losing numerous choice logs. All day and night, the crews worked with teams to haul water and fight fires. A farmer reported the loss of a threshing machine, large amounts of weed, a barn, and animals. More would lose their homes, fences, logs, and cordwood. The wells were mostly dry, making it difficult to fight the fire. There was increasingly an ominous glow of fires in the distance, and the smoke in the air was so thick that it was difficult to see and breathe. Steamboats on Green Bay and Lake Michigan constantly sounded fog horns due to the poor visibility. The danger is not yet over. In fact, the fresh winds which have prevailed during the past three days have given it new impetus. And in Pierce, Anape, Casco, and Lincoln, it has been more threatening since Sunday the previous week. During yesterday and today, our village has been enveloped in smoke so dense that it is impossible to see any object a mile distant in any direction. 
There is a rumor that the fences of 18 farms in Bay Settlement have been burned. A schoolhouse in this town was burned. We understand that the Catholic Church in the Flemish settlement, together with the priest's house and other buildings, are greatly dangered. These fires were just the beginning of the devastation. The settlements battled fires for months, but on the night of October 8th, things got much worse. The winds picked up and started a dangerous cycle of fire and wind feeding on each other. The high winds fed the fires, so the fires became larger. But I went to bed with Eugene and we settled in and proceeded to go to bed, but not before looking out of the door of our home. And I looked out and in the horizon, you could see this orange glow and this ominous feeling came over me. It was a feeling of doom and I was saying the rosary. When suddenly desire came running into the house and he said, grab Eugene, grab Eugene, we're going down into the well. The fire is coming, the fire is coming. And I could hear it slowly approaching and it kept coming in our direction. I grabbed Eugene and I wanted to take something of the house. He said, no, no, no time. Just grab that woolen blanket, we're going down into the well. As we ran out of the door, wild animals were coming into our clearing. Their eyes were lit up and scared. They were mixing with our oxen. Birds were falling out of the sky. It was a scene from hell and I couldn't get to the well fast enough. We ran in down into the well, covered ourselves up and listened to the fire as it approached. And it kept coming and coming and coming. And it went over us and on both sides of us and we prayed the rosary and passed Eugene back and forth so he wouldn't get burned. We stayed there all night. In the morning, we walked out of the well and looked around. Nothing, nothing was left. The fire moved rapidly and passed quickly over any given area. It didn't follow a straight path it spared some areas and devastated others, all over the course of one terrible night. People ran down into a well. The bottom five lived, the top two died. Mrs. Williamson was running to the potato patch also, but for some reason she didn't go there. She stopped a few feet and found a couple of stones and for whatever reason, she put her feet in the stones and covered herself up with a blanket. Twice, she had to kick bodies away before her blanket caught on fire. And she said it was terrible. She could smell burning flesh. She could hear the fat bristling on people. She said she didn't know how she could possibly have stayed still all that time. They spent the night that way. In the morning, she got up and hollered out. One son had survived. He had survived by running into a clearing and digging a hole in the ground and putting his nose in there. And his back was burned because his shirt kept get, getting caught on fire and he had to try to, to put it out. They said that um, the one of the survivors that was in, at the Tornado Tavern there, that's up the road here a ways, that um, he saved himself by crawling in the, in the river. There's a creek there. And he, and he crawled in that creek and he, and he had soaked his blanket with water. And he crawled in there and he stick his head in the water and then he'd come up and he'd have his blanket over his head. And while he was doing that, he says, there's a, there's a pig that came in there with him, but it died right away. Because he could, well, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't swim. He couldn't, well, he could swim, and he couldn't stay in the water at all. So he perished. The people of Sturgeon Bay were all set for the fire also, and they were going to go into Williamsonville. They loaded a buckboard with supplies but they couldn't get very far. There were no roads. 
You see, all those corduroy roads went up in ashes. There was nothing there. So they put their supplies on their back and walked in. When they got there, they said, no pen can describe what I saw. No pen can describe the smells and the bodies all over. Survivor accounts of the Great Fire may seem fantastic, but what they report is consistent with what we know of the conditions of the day and the mechanics of such a fire. A firestorm occurs because of weather conditions, specifically very strong straight line winds. When a fire develops, the heat from the fire adds to the strong straight line winds. But even more significantly, air drawn in adds to first the wind and also the heat. And all three of these give a cumulative or an additive effect, driving the fire, creating a firestorm that moves very rapidly at ground level. Probably a good analogy to this strong cumulative or additive effect would be a blowtorch that is directed at ground level. The firestorm moves very rapidly. Modern estimates uh, put it at 70 or more miles per hour. No way could somebody outrun it. No way could somebody move even on a horse in front of the fire. There were uh, reports from survivors of observing tornadoes of fire, swirling columns of flames. And that does make sense. That is an effect that's seen with these firestorms where air and heat create a column and go upwards. That was not the major uh, damage though for the firestorm. And if somebody was witnessing and actually survived the fire to describe these tornadoes, it's likely they weren't in front of that strong blowtorch effect, but rather they were at a place where the wind had uh, abated, the firestorm had abated, and they saw that tornado effect. So what occurred in October of 1871 was a series of firestorms throughout the Midwest. It occurred on both sides of the bay, in uh, Green Bay, but it also occurred in Chicago, as well as the lower peninsula of Michigan. Numerous cities as well as forests burned there, but they were all due to the same causes, drought and a strong straight line wind, as well as negligent use of fire that created all of these simultaneous fires throughout the upper Midwest. I think it's a historical inaccuracy that the fire jumped the bay. Again, this fire was all about the wind and the wind was moving from the southwest to the northeast. That's very well established. So it really is physically impossible for burning debris from the west side of the bay, the Peshtigo area, to go to the south against the wind into Door County and even into Brown County, where the village of New Franken was burned to the ground. And even on the west side of the Fox River, Fort Howard, what's now the west side of Green Bay, fire occurred. So very simply, it would have been impossible for burning debris to get carried against the wind. Certainly debris would have been thrown far into the air, far beyond, but it would have been in the direction of the wind. I've seen numerous people who have lost their homes due to fire. And after the fire, these people are trying to uh, recover. Well, they've got neighbors, family, and friends who are in a great position to help them out. But when there's a great disaster, such as what happened in Northeast Wisconsin in 1871, everybody is equally devastated and the psychological trauma extends throughout the community and their ability to function, whether it's one person or an entire community, really is compromised. And that's why the outside help is so important. It's, it's an absolute imperative to recovery. Many people, even those as close as the city of Green Bay, heard about the Chicago fire before word of the tragedy in Wisconsin reached them. Survivors in the Belgian settlement had no way to get word of their condition out, so they congregated together, waiting for help. They were injured, traumatized, and needed food, clothing, and shelter. But getting relief to the victims took days and weeks because telegraphs were down and roads were burned 
or covered with debris and the bodies of people and animals. We looked to the east and there were the Khoisman's coming slowly towards us. They looked like scepters of death. They were bl all blackened with soot. Their eyes were reddened and crazed looking. They didn't know what to do. You see, it was October and winter was coming. What were we going to eat? We had no idea what we were going to do. So we stayed and I remembered that we had planted gardens and so had Mrs. Koisman. So we went and dug up the gardens and took the potatoes and the turnips and things that we had planted so we had something to eat for a while. You see, it was also the same night I found out as the Chicago fire. This huge city was burning. What did they care about little Nouveau and Brussels and all of our little villages? But they did. The governor of Wisconsin was on his way to Chicago with a trainload of supplies. But his wife, Mrs. Fairchild, did something that I was so proud of her. She commandeered the next train loads and said, no, you're not going to Chicago. You're staying and helping the people of Wisconsin. A woman had never taken over like that before. It was something really, really wonderful. If wonderful can be the word. We received $5,000 from the people of Belgium. They started setting up aid stations all over. But you see, you couldn't just go and ask for money. You had to prove that what you lost was worthy of getting provisions. Just a few burned fences was not going to do it. You also had to work for your provisions. You couldn't just put out your hands and receive things. Funds came from across Wisconsin, the U.S., and around the world, including the Belgian government and its citizens. Donations of clothing, farm implements, bedding, medical assistance, and food came in. Relief committees were formed. For the great majority, however, Belgian neighbors would provide shelter for people and livestock as farms and homes were rebuilt. Many built rough shanties to get through the approaching winter and got their farms ready for planting in the spring. It wasn't until May of 1872, seven months later, that sufficient rains returned to replenish the parched earth. And in May, the government said, that's it. it was six months from the time of the fire, they said, no more are you on the government dole with your own good right arms, you go out and earn a living. And that's what we did. We looked around and we thought, oh, all of these huge trees that were there are no longer there. We can farm. The tragedy of the fire gave way to a transformation of the Belgian settlements. The massive trees that hindered the Belgians' dream of farming were destroyed and conditions for agriculture were greatly improved. The Belgians adapted and rebuilt. Oh, but this time we weren't just building them of logs. Mm -mm. We built them of logs, but then we put red brick on the outside. See, there was a lot of red clay in our soil, so we could make these red bricks. We built our homes, and we also put in a little porthole in the gables of the home. You see, we were going to use that as a lookout so that we could go up in the highest point of our house and look afar and see if another fire was coming. It has been almost 170 years since the first Belgians arrived and 150 years since the Great Fire. The red brick homes built by the Belgians reflect their experience with fire and the homes in their native Belgium.
Many of these homes are still in use today. The farming tradition that attracted the Belgians to Wisconsin continues to this day in Door, Brown, and Kiwani counties on family farms passed down through several generations, as well as large industrial farms. And the hard work and persistence that carried the Belgians through the early days of settling in the wilderness and rebuilding after the fire remains a part of the thriving local culture that is evident today. With perseverance and faith and good, strong right arms, we prospered and we went on to earn a living.